Hello and welcome to another episode of The Insight. And this week we're talking about private military companies and private security companies and their role in current conflicts and security situations. My name is Max Taylor and I'm a senior regional analyst here at Intelligence Fusion covering the Middle East and the Central Asia region. And this week I'm joined by Michael McCabe, the CEO of Intelligence Fusion, as well as Matt Pratton, the senior regional analyst for the Europe region. Both Matt and Michael have experience in the regular military as well as in the private sector as well. So we're hoping we can bring in a bit of your sort of uh, anecdotal experience as well as your knowledge just into this conversation, make things a little bit more interesting. But before we get started, I think I've mentioned PMCs and PSCs already. I think it's really important that we just define the difference between a PMC and a PSC. So, Michael, would you be able to clarify this for us? Mm -hmm. So, um, private military company, PMC, um, corporate entities who are often used by governments or militaries and providing a range of military services. PSC, private security company, um, again, they're corporate entities, but these are used more by multinational companies, NGOs, um, individuals, but again, you know, also government entities and, and militaries will use PSCs. I think the key difference is PMC are used in a more offensive capacity, whereas PSCs are used in a more defensive capacity. So providing things like executive protection, base protection, these sorts of things. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of confusion regarding and, and a lot of, um, conflation of the terms. So, you know, I, I see people kind of talking about PMCs when they're actually referring to PSCs and vice versa. Um, so, I, and I think, you know, it's it's really important to, to create that distinction between them. And I think that's something that we'll kind of keep throughout this podcast. Yeah. I think the, the, there's three key options for using PSCs and PMCs um, uh, 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 abroad. It's it's one is in the use of privatized protection, like, you know, you would see it Aegis or control risks or any of these general PSCs. The second is the the possibility of hiring some sort of rapid reaction force. And then the third is, is probably the most contentious is where you're actually completely um, outsourcing the, the operation to the PSC or PMC. Yeah, I think we're yet to see a fully autonomous PMC or PSC operation as yet. They do seem to be, there's been a few sort of minor ones, but no large scale ones. Although with that said, I think we are starting to see a trend towards more increasingly autonomous uh, operations by PMCs and PSCs. So we've talked about maybe the differences, but again, I think it's before we even move on, I think we should probably maybe talk about some of the key companies and key actors within the private military scene. So uh, again, the two of you have got a lot of experience in this. So could you maybe just talk to us about some of the uh, companies that you've seen that particularly uh, more major companies that you've seen who are active at the moment who are dominating the scene? I mean, from a PSC perspective, um, I said it, you know, I used to work for Aegis Defence Services. Um, you know, when I worked for them in Iraq, they had the, um, so you had Blackwater who had the State Department contract, whereas Aegis had the um, Department of Defence contract. And that was actually providing executive protection to the United States Army Corps of Engineers who were rebuilding Iraq. So they're building police stations, schools, hospitals, wastewater treatment plants, these sorts of things. Um, I also worked for Olive Group, who would be considered to be a PSC, um, you know, a variety of other entities out there, including the likes of um, Garda World, who are now actually the owners of Aegis. You've mm. got G4S. You know, there's quite a lot of consolidation that's occurring in the PSC sector. And I mean, that kind of, um, you know, we'll get onto it, at, 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 I'm sure, later on in this podcast, but that's probably one of the, the disadvantages from um, the PSC um, perspective is that, you know, if they do have a bad reputation, they can just rebrand or be bought out and that bad reputation probably, you know, disappears mm. to some sort of extent. Um, Matt, you want to take the PMC side? Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, it, PMCs, the, you know, there's, there's quite, there's quite a few, I mean, probably the most famous one of course would be, would be Blackwater, uh, and, you know, head, uh, headed by, uh, f formerly, uh, Head by uh, Eric Prince, although you've got there's there's also several others. I mean, when I uh, when I deployed to Iraq, I came across uh, came across a few. There was uh, a company called uh, MPRI, Military Professionals Resources Incorporated, and what these guys actually provide was a very sort of uh, niche capability of, of training. Uh, mm -hmm. When uh, I had, when I deployed to Iraq in 2007 with a, a as a as a soldier, the uh, you know before we you know even left Australia, we'd done you know, about three to six months worth of, of pre-deployment training. And then we had a brief period in Kuwait before going into Iraq. And before going into Iraq, we had about a day, a day or so of training from this, uh, this company, M MPRI. And they provided, uh, they provided, uh, I suppose, training for the, you know, soldier and uh, soldiers and uh, teams of soldiers like uh, sections with, you know, how to carry, uh, you know, sort of, you know, firing drills and whatnot. And the, instructors they had uh, 
very often, uh, well, a lot of them, in fact, all of them were uh, American, former U- US military. And the, the instructor I had, uh, I can't remember which, but he was either a former Army Ranger or uh, you know former uh, former uh, Special Forces or, or Green Berets. But the, the quality of training this guy provided with, uh, with one day it was you know it was it was you know it was almost invaluable i mean it almost uh, surpassed uh, you know, a lot of the training I, I had back in Australia beforehand. Well, so, generally speaking, these companies they recruit from quite experienced military personnel as well. So the guys oh, yeah. that move into these companies are not going straight into it. You know, they, as you said, yeah. he was a Ranger, Green Beret, or anything. Yep. These aren't just regular infantry units either. These are highly experienced uh, military units. So they're essentially they're not taking, not just taking any old people. Uh, the better PSCs and PMCs do seem to recruit almost exclusively at times from special forces. Uh, well, not, well, a lot of the time, uh, and and there's actually also, uh, you know, quite a quite a bit of recruitment from uh, from from elsewhere as well. I mean, mm. when uh, now I'm going to delve into the PSC side of things here, but I I, I worked uh, briefly for Garda World uh, as as a contractor, and the uh, team I was in. I mean, I'm not special. I'm not former special forces. I'm former intelligence corps. And far from very far from special forces. <laughs> oh, very, very far, <laughs> very. <laughs> and uh, the, the 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 team I was working with in in Libya, there was you know the the project manager, uh, the project managers. One was former logistics. Uh, the the other project manager was a former. Uh, I think it was former one para. So the ex special forces capability there, and other contractors I I bumped into uh, you know various various background uh, various different backgrounds but a lot of them uh, ex military but very proficient at what uh, uh, very proficient at what they were doing. And, you, and you're talking about there you know being on the range and getting this training from you know ex special forces and just how valuable that was. You know I think back to you know, my army days and you'd go on the range and and really you've got somebody from battalion who's done a skilled arms course, you know, and that's you know I'm ex intelligence course, so it's somebody from the intelligence corps who's done skilled arms. It's not special forces, it's not somebody from the SAS or SBS or even parachute regiment. So, you know, I can see how valuable that would be to get somebody from a special forces background to actually provide that training. But, you know, you mentioned before Max about, you know, how a lot of these People come from a special forces background. I think this this kind of falls into one of the the what's felt to be the, the disadvantages or some of the issues with the PSC PMC community is that you know when you know the, the big sort of heyday for the PSC community was the outbreak of the Iraq War as well as Afghanistan. And you know initially you had this glut of of ex special forces who actually mm. went out there. As the conflicts went on, there wasn't that. That glut of special forces to draw on, so the quality of the um, the security personnel reduced over a matter of years, and that's often cited as being one of the issues with you know the likes of Blackwater and others that just the caliber reduced over a period of years. I think that brings us on to our first point pretty nicely with you both talking about the quality of training you got, and that's exactly why do states use private military companies and private security companies? So if we could just discuss a little bit, what are the actual values of it and what is the draw of a private privatizing your, what most people see is, most people don't even realize is privatization in, in the military at all. So what is the draw of governments and militaries to the private sector when it comes to carrying out operations overseas? Cost. You know, they're often a lot cheaper. Mm. Um, you know, people talk about the the tooth to tail ratio of the military, and I think for the U.S. military in Iraq, it was uh, for every one tooth, so one frontline soldier, you had ten tail, so support people who are actually supporting that soldier. You know, in comparison for Aegis and Ramadi, ours was six tooth, so teeth, so you have um, you know six close protection operatives to one support personnel. That's slightly. Um, not accurate because we had we did have the support of the US military from you know from a dining facility perspective. Yeah. But even once, you know, if you'd have factored that in, we would still have been far leaner and more um, cost effective than deploying the military. So you know it, it ultimately it always comes down to cost. So cost is always going to be that biggest factor when it comes to the use of PSCs and PMCs. I think what you just said is quite important, especially cost kind of comes into this as well, in that a lot of wet militaries, particularly Western militaries, are starting to reduce their numbers as and their budgets are starting to be cut as well. So they're looking at ways to reduce their standing armies. So um, a, a quote that you've got on the screen now just explains the importance of redu- uh, the importance of contractors in the face of re- reductions in military personnel and military budgets because they can fill in gaps that typically the military just isn't prepared to fill or hasn't got the budget to fill, especially as we, we've got, uh, for example, the British Army is getting stretched right now. It's in multiple operations and with the current state of affairs and, and global politics, it looks like we could be involved in more in the coming decades as well. So, yeah, contractors, without a doubt, I do think fill in a role that the military hasn't always got the manpower to fill. 
And if you go back to Iraq, um, you know, back in the early days, the US military and State Department were crying out for contractors to actually come and support them because, you know, they needed to sort of um, fill positions and roles and activities that just they did not have the manpower to be able to fill. Um, and also you have a reticence of certain organizations to actually deploy to you know, um, you know, conflict theaters. You know, if you remember back in 2003, when the UN deployed to Iraq, you know, the mission was created five days later, you then had the Canal Hotel bombing, which killed 22 people and, and injured over 100. And that resulted in the UN withdrawing most of their 600 staff from the country. So the UN was then gone. Um, and I think you can see that it, one, it's, it feels like it's becoming a lot more difficult for militaries to deploy in certain regions and contractors, um, whether it's from a PSC perspective from a defensive side or a PMC perspective from an offensive side, can mm. fill that that gap. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they certainly do, uh, in, in, with regards to filling that gap, uh, probably the a major advantage of PMCs in particular is, is being able to provide a much more flexible solution uh, as opposed to using... Uh, using a you know uh, using a military because a military is uh, mainly focused on uh, carrying out maneuver warfare. Uh, I mean, a, a really good example, although it's a really good example I, I came across is actually 2012 with uh, you know uh, with Benghazi 2012. The uh, you know, if you you know I'm sure a lot of people have seen or you guys have seen the 13 Hours movie Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Mm. Now those that particular company uh, GRS was provided as a as a sort of protection force for uh, for the CIA uh, on the on the ground there. Now, with of course, I'm speculating on sort of CIA's work, but you know, try if they were trying to do that with a conventional military force there, it just wouldn't have worked uh, wouldn't have worked whatsoever. But using I suppose a, a private company staffed by you know a former a predominantly form uh, I think almost exclusively uh, former special forces I mean that a lot of those guys in that particular incident were either Navy seals or Army Rangers but uh, having that small element there you know was able to be deployed in a much more flexible manner as opposed to what a conventional military would be able would be able to do I mean yeah. it's, it's not a dig at conventional militaries it's just they're that kind of task isn't fit for purpose also, for deploying a, element. Deploying regular forces to a country such as Libya is quite a big political statement and you just don't make that statement when you do it via security companies. So for example, if the US were to deploy a thousand soldiers to Libya right now, I think that would be more than just the deployment. That'd be quite political. Whereas to deploy a thousand PMC personnel or PSC personnel would, in all honesty, would probably slip below the radar. So flexibility wise, it offers a lot more. <laughs> Usually would slip below the radar, but I suppose uh, when we get f further on with a, a particular topic for this podcast, <laughs> more than likely not yeah. <laughs> a I, particular group starting with W. <laughs> I mean, I think from I think that from a PSC perspective, that should be fairly uncontroversial. Like I know that it still is considered controversial because they are private entities who ultimately are driven by profit. But you know, as long as they are um, professionally ran, you know, they follow the you know their their they fall into some sort of legal jurisdiction, whether that's, you know, like we were um, in Iraq after the States of Forces Agreement, you know, if we committed a crime in Iraq, we were subject to Iraqi law. So I think from a PSC perspective, that should be fairly uncontroversial. You know, the issue is, and, and uh, is the PMC side, but there are advantages to PMCs and, and their and their use. And, you know, you just have to look at, um, you know, Rwanda um, and executive outcomes and what they did there, you know. Um, when the Rwandan genocide was, was sort of, beginning, executive outcomes had, had contacted the UN and stated that they could deploy um, 1,500 personnel who'd be supported by their own air and fire support within six weeks. They estimated the operation um, would cost around $600,000 per day, so $150 million US dollars in total. Now, what actually happened was that the UNAMA 2 deployed after the genocide and cost five times more than what executive outcomes claimed they would have actually conducted the task for. So, you know, you had a private military company there who were willing to deploy, set up these humanitarian corridors and actually prevent um, or mitigate the genocide, the UN force then deploys after the genocide, after 500 to 600,000 people have been killed. Um, and this question still lingers for the PMC side is, what what would we do if another Rwanda genocide was to actually occur? Who's actually going to step in? Yeah, a big, uh, a big point of a lot of these private military companies and security companies in the past has been how quick they can deploy, whereas, as you just mentioned, uh, an international brigade or an international uh, peacekeeping force, again, it's a very political issue. It's not just a military issue. And it, it can take months, even years, to even agree on the limitations and exactly who's going to be deployed. So, as you said, 
they fill quite an important political role as well as a military role. And I think that's something that's often overlooked. I think a lot of people see these as just tactical military assets, whereas in reality, they're not. They can be used as political assets as well. Uh, and that that's, you know, a PMC deploying in, in a peacekeeping role. You know, there is also the opportunity for, or the possibility of a PMC being um, deployed in an offensive role. And we saw that again, again, um, with executive outcomes in 1995. So this was in Sierra Leone. Um, so the Sierra, Le- Sierra Leone government was at near defeat from the revolutionary United Front. Now, these were a, a nefarious re- rebel group who were chopping the hands off civilians using terror tra- tactics on them. Um, now, um, some multinational mining interests um, and the government hired the private military firm Executive Outcomes, which was made up of um, veterans from the South African Special Forces, South African military. Um, and they deployed a battalion-sized unit of assault infantry, numbering in the low hundreds. And they were supported by um, combat helicopters, light artillery, as well as a few armoured vehicles. And Executive Outcomes were able to defeat the IUF in a span of weeks, and its victory brought enough stability in Sierra Leone to hold its first election in over a decade. Um, now, after the contract was actually terminated, the war then restarted, and then four years later, in 1999, the US was the UN was sent in, and despite having a budget and personnel size nearly 20 times that of executive outcomes, the UN force took several years of operations and a rescue by the British military to come close to the same result. So again, that's a PMC who's operating in an offensive capability who brought stability for elections to be held. So again, you know, I, I can see why people are reticent about the use of PMCs in an offensive capability. But again, as long as they're professionally run, as long as their aims are stated, um, and as long as they are subject to the appropriate legal authorities, um, you know, it's something that I don't think should be ruled out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely agree on that one. In fact, just what you were mentioning with regards to the to the costs of a UN deployment versus you know a, a PMC uh, deployment, just the the cost advantages of that, and not just cost, but the actual actual end result of say you know executive outcomes versus UN. It actually reminded me of a. a, a I suppose a more recent one. Uh, there was an interview I was listening to with uh, of Eric Prince, of you know C- uh, former CEO of, Bl- of Blackwater and founder of Blackwater, and uh, in the interview he he in the interview he had he brought up an example of how uh, during the of course about up until about probably off the top of my head would have been about five years ago piracy in the Horn of Africa. It was a major, pro- uh, major problem for, uh, for for maritime shipping, and it, it you know the efforts to try and combat it you know with multinational uh, naval deployments to the area, sort of patrolling, patrolling those waters. It you know, provided an element of security, but wasn't very effective in in sort of stopping the problem at its source. Yeah, unless these navy personnel are willing to deploy actual military personnel onto civilian vessels as well. It's yeah, only and, so much they can do. And uh, Eric Prince actually, uh, for, according to him, he approached the UAE government, and he, they you know he they took out a contract with them to actually raise a small for a small uh, sort of policing force uh, to actually uh, to actually. Uh, Counter uh, conduct counter piracy operations, uh, targeting the logistics of uh, of the of the pirates operating in those waters. Uh, so this is on land in Somalia. Yeah, in, right. yeah, uh, and and also possibly out sort of more the more sort of littoral areas, which the navy wouldn't really be able navies wouldn't really be able, be able to respond to quickly. And it was effective. I mean, uh, I, I haven't come across many reports of piracy in that area for a while. Uh, but uh, ironic, uh, uh, with uh, what Michael, uh, Michael, you're bringing up with regards to the cost benefit, it turned out that the costs of tr- raise, of taking out that contract and raising that capability turned out to actually be cheaper than the ransom bills a lot of maritime uh, companies were paying to recover their people and assets when uh, when the uh, when their vessels mm. would get hijacked by Somali pirates. Yeah. So it's another an, another example of just you know what kind of benefits PMCs PMCs can provide. So we've spoken quite a lot about I think we summarise as the Western experience of PSCs and PMCs. We've spoken a lot about Western PMCs. We haven't spoken much about Wagner, who are really important. So I think we're sort of moving in a bit slightly different vein here about why the Russian government has, although the actual connections between the Russian government and Wagner are quite grey. Not everyone it's, it's generally believed that they've got informal links to Russian government personnel, and so Wagner very much is closely linked with the Russian government. So why, Matt, you've got experience with Wagner in Ukraine from your own work. So why exactly did the Russian government use Wagner and what advantages did using this 
quite a they're quite an unknown entity really at the time when they first entered Ukraine. What advantage did this bring to the Russians, and why did the Russians use it? Yeah, well, I suppose Ukraine, uh, you know, the current war in Ukraine, that's where Wagner Group uh, made their debut. I suppose you could say on the on the international stage. Now, I suppose just for benefit of reference, referencing. Uh, this part to the to the platform, uh, you know, on our platform, you can actually look at you, what's going on in Ukraine with the tag uh, Donbass, and that will sort of isolate what we've been logging uh, in the Donbass region. Now, with all those incidents you'll see there, uh, there's not really any sort of direct uh, involvement of Wagner Group in those incidents, mm. but that situation you see on the platform is actually was actually a situation sort of that's Wagner helped set up uh, bef- prior to the Russians going into uh, in, uh, in uh, essentially invading Ukraine back in 2014 the Wagner group were actually on the ground in that region sort of creating instability kind of ma- manufacturing a situation the Russians could use to justify uh, sending sending their forces into that region as well as the uh, Crimea peninsula so uh, in that in with regards to Ukraine uh, and Wagner Group's uh, importance there, they were sort of used as a insurgency for hire in, in a way to sort of manufacture a situation for uh, a military to, to go in. And to this day, you see a, uh, what can only be described as a, as a stalemate between the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's military and, well, there's a lot of speculation as to you know, who they are exactly, mm. but... There's a lot of Russian equipment. There's a lot of Russian tanks. A lot of Russian backed forces, basically. Russian backed yeah. forces, but uh, there's you know I, I don't know anyone else who has the kind of BM twenty uh, BM twenty one grad launchers that they currently have. <laughs> so were they the little green men in that situation, or uh, is this part of the issue with PMCs? Is that it creates that confusion where you know you can basically deploy service personnel in military fatigues without any sort of um, uh, insignia on, and then it's confusing whether or not that is actually a standing army or whether or not it's actually a PMC. Yeah, it's uh, it's it definitely helps. It's uh, it, it, it's it creates it does create a lot of confusion. Or you could even have a situation where you contract out to a, a private military full of you know ex military personnel, say like Wagner Group, to pose as a you know to, to pose as an, as another actor. So. Mm. The you know that the advantage there is an is, is an element of deniability. If the you know if one of those personnel gets caught with a a, a, a Russian looking uniform with some Russian looking weapons or a, or weapons or uniform of a, another state, there's an element of deniability where that state can say no, he's but may look like us, may act like us, but no, he's he's not a Russian serviceman. <laughs> And, and can that be seen as an advantage of PMCs, where there is that deniability, so you don't end up getting two states actually fighting with each other? And I'm thinking of the Syrian incident here. Yeah, um, the Derazor. When uh, so to clarify, is an incident in Derazor in Syria uh, quite a few years back now, when uh, Syrian government forces backed by Russian Wagner uh, personnel attacked. I believe it was an oil field. I don't know too much about the details. Of the incident itself attacked an oil field that was defended by Kurdish SDF forces as well as U.S. special forces, and the incident essentially culminated in US air assets targeting the Syrian and the Wagner forces leading to very high casualties among the Wagner personnel and the political fallout was actually quite muted if this was Russian personnel attacking uh, US personnel this would be a major diplomatic crisis but because this was Wagner the, uh, the Kremlin essentially denied involvement completely which they could because it was it wasn't Russian personnel it was a private military company and the political fallout that could potentially have come from hundreds of, of people getting in an engagement between hundreds of people from both sides was completely negated almost. And it's it's become a bit of an infamous incident ever since in which the use, the PMC was essentially used as a proxy by the Russians. Although, with that said, there is disagreement over whether the Russians knew what was going on or not, but we won't get into that. But yeah, so carry on. That's overview of that incident. And I think that's the key word there. It's this proxy, mm, you know, yeah. and governments and nations are using proxies across the world and the PMCs or PSCs are just one element of that. It can be... Um, militias, it can be, um, you know, criminal enterprises, it can be a, a variety of different actors who can be used as proxies for states to then actually conduct uh, warfare and influence operations against each other. Yeah, and Turkey recently actually has um, sort of bridged the gap, I guess, between using proxies and whether they, when proxies then, I guess, become private military contractors in that Turkey's always backed the Syrian National Army in northern Syria, but then in more recent conflicts, Turkey's used fighters from the Syrian National Army to to support Turkey's foreign policy in both Libya and more recently in Azerbaijan. And whether or not these were private military contractors or whether they were just fighters that had been shipped by <coughs> Turkey with Turkish logistic support, 
is actually unclear. No, there's very little known about the the Syrian fighters that were in Azerbaijan, and there's a lot of fake news around it. So I don't want to get too far involved, but I think what it represents is Turkey has essentially bridged the gap, and it's it's starting to use it's these con- these fighters and these proxies. It's starting to use contractors as proxies, and it's starting to get proxies from other countries to use them as contractors and others. So it's, it's becoming a gray, what's already quite a grey area is actually starting to becoming. A little bit more confusing, and it's, it's quite clearly bringing quite strong results for the people that are using them as well. Wagner in Ukraine and yep. Turkey's use of the SNA, and there's actually also, also uh, Wagner in Libya, where yeah. they they were actually put there. You know, when I when I was working uh, for Garda World in in Libya, uh, I'd come across quite a few reports of uh, of you know sort of of Russian uh, of sort of Russian advisors uh, amongst the amongst the LNA and uh, late later report uh, amongst the, sorry the Libyan National Army. Uh, so the forces led by Khalifa Haftar, and you know, further reporting, it turned out that these were Wagner Group, uh, Wagner Group personnel providing, you know, sort of you know training, uh, sort of training and expertise as a as a PMC traditionally does, especially like, and Western mm. PMCs are you know are, are excellent are excellent at at, at that. But uh, at the same time, they're also providing sort of you know, uh, you know advisors to uh, advisors to commanders. Uh, now, the media reporting. Got a little convoluted. Started making claims of you know sort of Russian mer- Russian mercenaries on the on the front line, sort of creating an, an impression that you had you know LNA fighter you know trying to take Tripoli and alongside him is uh, you know a, a bunch of Russians mm. you know joining in the fight with him, but wasn't really the case. It was more so you had Russian mer- you had sort of Russian uh, Wagner Group personnel just providing sort of advice to. Uh, you know, to the LNA commanders, you know, say, you know, usually I say a major sort of a equivalent or, a, or or higher. But Wagner's pretty active in disseminating its material on uh, Telegram in particular. And one thing I've noticed is they know that people confuse him with other people and they like to stoke that, that almost that fear of them, that sort of aura around them. And I think one of their sort of informal sayings is there where we are not. <laughs> Basically, in some ways, it's both admitting that, they're, that they are what you think and also denying it. And, they, and as a result, they seem to really relish in this acting in the realm of plausible deniability. So you might know that they're Russian personnel or Russian contractors, but you can't 100% confirm it. So I think that brings us on to our next section then. So we've spoken a lot about sort of the values behind PSCs and what makes them important to militaries and and contractors. But over the years, a a casual observer can see that there has been controversies and there has been lots of accusations leveled at them. Some of them, some of them more wild than others. So I thought this would be quite a good time just to uh, discuss some of the issues that people have with PMCs and PSCs, and maybe talk about some of some of what we've uh, what we've seen from our own, our own work as well. So we spoke earlier about cost and uh, the privatization of it, and I think it, not just in the military but in any sector, I think cost is quite an important part of of the private private sector, and companies are always going to be looking for the lower the lo- to offer a lower cost, and sometimes to offer a lower cost that means offering a lower quality. So, is there anything that you guys sort of want to add on that sort of that race to the bottom when it comes to prices? I mean, we mentioned maritime security. You know, with Iraq was sort of seen as the um, how can I put it, the, the gold rush for mm. the PSC and, uh, movement. Um, so you had all these people who kind of flocked over there and these, uh, you know, back in the early days, it was like you know, people were on $1,000 a day, $1,200 a day. And that slowly reduced throughout the conflict. And then the next thing you had was the the maritime security aspect. And people thought, right, this is the next area where PSCs are going to move to. And they did. And, and you know, you had, you know, armed security guards who were put on ships. But again, you will always get, competitiveness there yeah. which is which is good to an extent because you know it keeps the um it keeps the um the prices um lean and affordable but as you say you know you went from having expats who were western expats who were put on ships again from probably a marine background then you'd have um providers who were coming in who had ukrainian forces or indian forces and and perhaps that quality reduced um to an extent um, and the price reduced as well so you know, you're always going to have that you know, as people People go for a more cost-effective cost effective option. You will get a, a lower quality um, a, a, of product. But again, it comes back to that that motivation of, of profit um, issue for, for PMCs. And people make the argument that um, PMCs may act to actually extend its contract by prolonging the conflict. Um, and, and I do take issue with this because you know warfare is not you know you're not just slowing down the manufacturing of a good. You are you are prolonging a conflict where you're 
people, your personnel can be killed, you know? So it's it's not as straightforward as just going, oh, well, PMCs will extend the conflict just so they continue mm. to be paid. I'm sure, you know, to an extent, there are certain areas where that could be true, but it's just not as simple as just saying they'll extend the contract to actually um, pro- and prolong the conflict. Yeah. I think, yeah, as you guys, I think I agree with you on that. I think saying that they deliberately prolong conflicts as a generalization is a pretty weak criticism. And also contracts exist pretty much everywhere and at any time, even in countries where they're p- potentially quite secure there's always contracts for the right company so i don't think we're at a point when there's so few contracts available to these companies that prolonging conflict is something that they're interested in but yeah i mean there's always going to be examples of where privatization has been a good thing or it's been a bad thing mm. just look at the railways in this country yeah. um as an example i think you know another disadvantage which can be argued is that pscs and pmcs become a drain on the military because um you'll have uh, you know, military personnel who've perhaps gone to conflict zones on their standard salary of 30, 35,000, 40,000 pounds. And then they they hear stories of contractors, which I certainly did in 2006. I saw them come in and you know, I'll be asking <laughs> oh, them, you know, how much do you earn? And when you find well. out how much they earn, you think, oh, well, I wouldn't mind yeah. that. Um, and, you know, you come out and, and you go into these environments and, you know, there, there used to be salaries of like $1,000 a day, $1,200 a day. But, you know, I kind of hear salaries for intelligence analysts now in Iraq is around about the forty thousand pound mark, so these aren't huge salaries anymore. Mm. But um, you know, perhaps that draw is less there anymore than it used to be. But I think, in, in part, the military is also to blame in terms of just look at the the um, the ability for the retention rate now for the military in the UK and just how bad it is for a variety of different reasons. You know, one of which being the pursue uh, the pursuit of soldiers post conflict um, as part of things like the IHAT, the Iraqi um, Historical Allegations Team. Um, so these are these are things that are impacting retention. But I do, you know, still think there is an argument to be made that PMCs and PSCs become a draw and actually become a drain on the militaries who have paid to train these people. Um, yeah, taking some of the most talented personnel as well, really, because uh, <coughs> if you're very good at what you do in the military, you're going to start looking at getting, quite, as you said, it's not always the case when you'll get more money. But generally speaking, the, con- uh, the pay for a contract these days is still higher than a regular soldier. So you're going to start getting, it's not just any old soldiers, well, it would probably be the better ones out of every platoon, every every company, whatever it may be, would start maybe drifting away after a few years of, after their first sort of, after their first deployment, perhaps. I would possibly say that that's actually, a, I would lean towards that being actually a, an advantage of, of PMCs and PSCs, just having the existence of, of, uh, of competition for for militaries what that uh, in effect does create just like any kind of uh, you know in, in any sort of situation uh, you know, in any sort of situation of capitalism is you know competition actually does provide benefits and i would say the major benefit in that regard is because there's alternatives for soldiers in militaries uh you know with the provision of pmcs and psc's that actually forces uh, you know, senior command, senior leadership in uh, the government and sort of senior leadership level in militaries to actually take retention of personnel extremely seriously. Yeah. Because, mm. you know, if they don't, well, you know, it, it was, it, you know, it's a situation where if a, you know, soldier or a, a highly trained, uh, you know, a highly trained and highly competent, uh, you know, a member can sort of decide, well, um, things aren't going well here. I can, Go and join. So I can go and apply for jobs with Garda World or with uh, with uh, Academy or FR or FRG or or a variety of others. Uh, in fact, actually, it sort of remind reminds me of the aftermath of when I deployed to Iraq in two thousand seven. When we got back, we had a, a whole lot of guy a whole lot of guys put their discharge paperwork in afterwards uh, because they wanted to see, they wanted, you know, for various reasons, but wanted alternatives. And at the time, a major alternative was the mining sector in Australia, and they were providing better pay, better conditions. And the effect of that made a lot of commanders sit back and go, okay, what do we need to do to make sure our guys stay in? Mm. So I think the existence of uh, PMCs and PSCs just provides a sort of a, I suppose you could call it, a, I suppose a, a wake up call in regards to for militaries to take retention as serious as it needs to be. 
without kind of getting into a whole debate on capitalism, I mean, <laughs> so, you know, as long as the, the free market is able to to operate freely and effectively without nepotism or political contacts who are allowing certain big companies to consistently get contracts and therefore provide a poorer service, um, you know, as long as the free market is able to actually operate, then private companies should be an effective solution to some of these issues. I think one of the main issues that people worry about, though, with the privatization of um, military militaries is the future potential of private wars and wars without states where you do have you know whoever can pay the highest price the ability to hire the best private military that's out there and i think that that is always the, the, the i think one of the main worries for people about the whole privatization mm. um but i mean we're seeing privatization across the security um state whether it's um from a police perspective or um you know in security services you know they're using private companies private software private tools that perhaps you know they wouldn't be able to create internally because they'd lack that innovation um so yeah it's it, it seems to be a, a very delicate um balancing um, act to play. Moving on from what we've just been talking about there then. So one criticism of PMCs and PSCs that I see all the time is people talking about what oversight are these companies liable to? Because it's not always clear, especially when they're operating overseas. And I think a lot of these uh, these concerns come from the earlier years, perhaps immediately after 2003, when uh, a law regarding PMCs and PSCs just hadn't quite caught up with what was actually going on. So do you guys know much about the legal oversight side of it and how this is developed in, the, in this century? It's certainly one of the main concerns that people have about private military and security companies. And and those that actually oppose the use of PMSCs, what they argue is that um, you know mercenary groups once in a conflict area, they're difficult to control, they're barely accountable. And at the moment, there's no international regulatory scheme that exists to actually bring the PMSCs under international law. Um, now, you know, what I certainly saw at Aegis in Iraq was once the status of forces agreement came in force, which was in sort of 2009, 2010 time, was that we then fell under Iraqi law. Um, you know, so if I actually committed a crime in Iraq, I would then be subject to the Iraqi judicial process. And you know, one contractor, Danny Fitzsimmons, who um, shot a colleague of his, then shot an Iraqi um, guard in the leg. You know, he served ten years in an Iraqi prison. I think he got back in 2019. So, um, you know, I get the 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 worry regarding it, and I think part of the issue as well is it depends on what sort of state is the judicial system in in that country. Because if it's a completely failed state, then the judicial system does not function. How do you then actually um, bring the contractors um, you know, to book regarding what they've done? I think contractors on the different levels of scrutiny, depending on what country they're from. So Absolutely. I think yeah. Western PMCs and PMC, PSCs have been around for a long time, and I think they've, they've got a lot of oversight over them these days. Whereas talking only about Wagner, for example, as well as um, we're seeing uh, private security companies come out from all over the world now. And depending on the country they're from, they're going to get different levels of scrutiny. So we're seeing a lot more Chinese companies now protecting the Belt and Road Initiative. And largely these Chinese companies are quite small and they've largely stuck to um, the private security realm more than the private military realm. But even with that said, anecdotal experience from other people and stuff we've been reading about them does suggest that they are under much looser restrictions than perhaps Aegis, Olive Group or any other companies that you guys have worked for in the past. So I think if you've got companies from different countries operating in the same area, you're going to get friction depending on who can do what. And it's going to get very complicated very quick in a case of a in, in crisis, I think. And in part, it depends on what legal um, environment there is that this this company is coming from. And you've got the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is the US legislation, but the UK Bribery Act is is the most stringent that's out there. Mm. So, you know, us as, as UK citizens, if we go and operate abroad and we actually pay a bribe, where then we then can be subject to the UK Bribery Act when we go back to the UK. So you know, in part, it comes from the actual the, the host nation of that that company, as you said. Mm. And I suppose just to sort of, uh, I think what's also important to bring up with regards to the regulatory envir uh, environment for a lot of Western PMCs and PSCs is from what I experienced when I was working for Garda World. Is even though PMCs and PSCs operate across the world it's still actually quite a, a small community and there's a strong element of word of mouth uh, amongst contractors, which with that, uh, that sort of creates a situation that complements regulations with, uh, in a way of sort of, of policing, of contractors policing their own. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, contractors I worked, I worked with in Libya, you know, I got to sort of know about predecessors in, 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 in the job I was doing and that, certainly create a situation for me of, okay, I'd better make sure I 
dot every single I and cross every single T. Otherwise, it's you know words going words going to spread very very easily if I'm a if I'm a poor performer. Mm-hmm. So, I think that and it's that sort of word of mouth scenario also complements uh, that complements regulations uh, through essentially contractors policing their own to a very good standard. Yeah, and I mean we you know we've we've kind of spoken about PMCs and PSCs. Um, I think one of the the more recent anomalies in this sort of grey area is that the the whole incident with Silver Core International. Mm. You know, they um, it was twenty twenty. Um, 3rd of May 2020, so you know, 60 troops um, attempted to um, conduct an incursion into Venezuelan territory, um, and the plan was to actually um, abduct um, President Maduro. Um, you know, seemed to be very, very poorly thought out. You know, Silver Corps National initially had started off as as a PSC. They were doing executive protection. They were doing um, school shooter prevention, and then suddenly moved into this this um, attempt to overthrow um, a government. And, and I think they're a very they are an anomaly within the sector and, and um, you know, a very unusual incident and, and not very representative of what the sector is about. Um, but this is a disadvantage because there are these entities who operate and, and can actually conduct these sorts of um, operations, which seem to not have um, um, any backing from um, any any government or, or major player within Venezuela. I think that Silver Core incident actually brings us onto the sort of final stage quite nicely, which is when we're just going to look at what we see kind of coming in the future in the world of private military contractors and private security contractors because that silver core incident was an example of kind of using the scale that you mentioned earlier as an example of a private company acting more autonomously and being more offensive in their operations and i think we're seeing more and more of that we saw it with wagner we've seen it with turkey's use of pmcs in azerbaijan and libya and we've seen this blurring of the lines between when does a proxy become a pmc you know when you're taking syrian proxies from syria and putting them in other conflict zones it's, it's a bit of a gray area I think we're seeing more and more of this. And as we've seen as well, the use of these proxies slash PMCs, PSCs, has also allowed states to negate some of the traditional political challenges that they would face if they tried to do that with regular forces. And the Silver Core incident, whilst an anomaly in that it, it seemed to be a bit of a, a hatchet job, it was part, I guess you could be maybe see it as an, an increasing move towards PSCs and PMCs becoming a political tool as much as just supporting the military itself. Yeah, I think that it, it all comes back to, you know, are we ever going to see conventional warfare again? Or are we now in a situation where weapons of mass destruction, whether they are you know, um, nuclear weapons or chemical weapons, biological weapons, they're, they're so widely distributed is that we can't really have conventional warfare mm. anymore. So we're having to actually conduct warfare between nations through proxies. You know, so there's, there's a big question there that we, we would have to answer. But you know, I think there was an argument that that is the case. And then you know, if that is the case, then you're going to see whether it's criminal elements or people using uh, militant groups, terrorists, to actually conduct proxy warfare or the use of PSCs and PMCs as part of that. Absolutely. I agree with that. I think it's uh, as we sort of move away from the conventional war and the, the possibility of it taking place becomes much much less, uh, much less, lower, I think we're going to start looking towards proxies and PMSCs to carry out traditionally what's been sort of the military's realm, I think. And I think it was a really interesting point regarding what you said about Turkey and their essential use of a uh, militia group and then just rebranding them as a PMC to then be used in other theatres mm. with which they're operating. I think we're going to see more of that. Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. And although I, I suppose one thing that could be, uh, one thing that hasn't sort of, I, I haven't come across it yet, but I, I think one one major test that we'll see coming up for the likes of the groups that's, uh, that Turkey uses with regards to Syrians and the use of the, and the, use of the, the, the Wagner group by by the Russian government is, uh, I suppose, when they have their own sort of version of a, a, a Silver Core International, uh, silver, a Silver Core incident. So when they sort of have that kind of situation come up, I think that will be, a, I suppose, a, the major test of how, of what kind of, you know, how PMCs and PSCs will advance because there'll be examples of, you know, you've got the, you know, Silver Core incident for sort of Western P, uh, PMCs and PSCs, and then whatever happens with regards to say the likes of uh, Wagner and whoever uh, Turkey uses will be an example there. So that could probably be the sort of the, the I suppose the the, the litmus test mm. uh, to you know for the for the future. 
Yeah, it will all depend on the uh, the nation's nefarious intent to use that group. You yeah. know, PMCs yeah. can be used in a, a positive way, whether it's through peacekeeping or or being used against groups like Boko Haram terrorist groups, or they can be used in nefarious ways as we've as we've seen. So I think that brings our podcast to an end. So now we're just going to summarise what we've actually talked about and actually talk about what the actual insights were from this podcast. So I think the first and one of the ones we spoke about at the start was how important it is to actually differentiate between a private military company and a private security company. Because whilst there is some crossover in their roles at times, generally speaking, the two com- the two types do carry out very different roles and they are, they are very different types of companies. And to bring the two together is, would be quite a weak analysis. So a second insight, I think, is the variety of actors in the private military and private security realm as a whole. These aren't just Western companies. You're looking at companies from China, from Russia, from Western countries as well, and from anywhere. There's no real restriction on uh, on who can who can bring out a company. And whilst there is these major companies, a few of the names we've have discussed, there's hundreds and thousands of smaller of smaller companies as well that we probably haven't even come across ourselves. So the third insight, I think, would be that. Whilst there are plenty of advantages for PMCs and PMC, PSCs, we've also explored some of the disadvantages and some of the criticisms, so they do have to be measured against each other and balanced out. Uh, a fourth insight, I think, was a good one that we came across, was uh, their use depending on the state uh, the state which owns a PMC or the state which that company is from. So certain countries may use a PSC or a PMC for one role, whereas other countries may use them for a more offensive role. And we saw that with our example used about Wagner in the Ukraine. And finally, our final sort of insight is with the drawdown of militaries and the changing nature of modern conflict, I think there's going to be more and more space for private military companies and private security companies to act. And there's going to be more and more opportunities for them as well. And I think they're going to be a more, an increasingly important role in whether it be just providing logistics or actually providing combat personnel in certain situations. I think this, uh, this, we're going to see more activity from the private sector going forwards. So thanks for your input today, guys. I thought that was uh, some really good chat throughout the podcast and it was really good drawing on your experience and your respective careers as well. It, really good. it gave us a bit of insight into, into what you guys have, uh, have, have been doing in the past. So from the viewer's perspective, if you liked what you saw today, then please like, comment, and subscribe on any of our social media channels and we're looking forward to hearing from you.